am my own special creation. So come take a look, give me the look or the ovation. It's my world that I want to have a little pride in. My world and it's not a place I have to hide in. Life's not worth a damn till you can say I am what I am. I am what I am. I don't want praise. I don't want pity. I bang my own drum. Some think it's noise. I think it's pretty. And so what if I love each sparkle and each bangle? Why not try to see things from a different angle? Your life is a sham till you can shout out, I am what I am. I am what I am, and what I am needs no excuses. I deal my own deck, sometimes the ace, sometimes the deuces. It's one life and there's no return and no deposit. One life, so it's time to open up your closet. Your life is a sham till you can shout out, I am what I am. Yes, life's not worth a damn till you can shout out, I am what I am. is what I am. <laughs> Hello, how wonderful to see you on this very auspicious, very special seasonal uh, salon, Salon Salon de la Vie. It's special because this is the day to, uh, it's the international day to eliminate or end violence against women, which feels like a very uh, important thing to mark. Um, and to do so, we've chosen uh, quite a specific uh, thing to do on it, I suppose. We're launching today, we'll have launched, you may have already seen, hopefully played with, um, our online exhibition. And as you know, usually we use the salons to celebrate uh, one or amplify one really amazing woman. Um, we're choosing to launch today and do a salon that kind of encompasses that exhibition because that exhibition amplifies the achievements of a lot of amazing women. So uh, what it's about is Greenham Common Women's Peace Camp. Um, we worked very closely with a lot of Greenham women, a lot of Greenham women artists, and a lot of uh, artists in general, to make something with an Arts Council emergency grant during the summer and autumn this year. Um, and it's uh, interactive, it's multimedia, you get to do a sort of treasure hunt where you can go and find the sort of material we've made. Please check it out, and if you've checked it out already, give me a little uh, heads up in the comments about how you've experienced it and what your first thoughts are. Um, it's the first thing we've done like this at all ever. It's a huge shift in our, our work. The amazing Animorph uh, were fantastic to work with. We couldn't have done it without them, but it's all learning experience for us. This is a big new deal. <laughs> so, um, and the big new deal as well, of course, the big, uh, the big deal we want to celebrate is the Greenham women and their achievements and their, what they gave to the world, what they inspire in other women. Um, to give you a flavour both of, of what, what the camp life was like and also um, the kind of stuff you'll find on the site, I'm going to read you a couple of extracts now, written for us by one of our Greenham women artists, an amazing woman called Sue Say, who lived at Greenham for over a year um, <clears throat> as a young woman of 18, 19. Uh, and uh, these are just a few snapshots that we've had, uh, that she wrote for us, that kind of explain some of her experiences at the camp. So this is one about non-violent direct action. This is how they used to break into the base. This is her personal account of how that felt. It's 2 a.m., I'm freezing. I'm lying on my stomach between two bushes, the bolt cutters pressing into my thighs. I can hear the trees around me swaying gently in the strong breeze, leaves dancing around. I crawl silently forward, stopping only to pinch my nose to stop the threatening sneeze. I raise my arm. Everyone hits the deck. I plunge my face into the dirt and stay motionless. The approaching footsteps are firm and confident. I wait till they're level and then start my account. I, I have a count of 20 until he turns again. Time to cut the fence. I look silently forward, leap, 20, 18, 19. I have a two and a half foot hole in the fence. I withdraw back to the safety of the bushes as the soldier continues his patrol. 
My heart is pounding, racing. I'm so excited. In this minute, right now, as I lie in the dirt with my sisters, I realise this is fun. Here's another. As I say, we have these voiced by some amazing actors and you can find them on the site. Or you could treasure hunt around, click on objects, and you'll find these little testimonials, songs, scenes, all sorts of stuff. Lesbians. Lots and lots of lovely lesbians. Cosmic, witchy, earthy worshipping lesbians. Hippie chicks by the dozen, butchers by the barrel load. Scholars, magistrates and wives, we're all women, all refusing to stay silent. We decorated our homes, the fence, the base, at every opportunity. We used the symbol of the spider's web to show how even the most delicate of things can be strong when woven together. The world may have seen women as the weaker sex, but we were determined to show the world that we could affect change together peacefully. We had to protect the children, the future. Man's war machine had to be stopped and it was going to take a lot of women to do it. Lots and lots of lovely women. And finally, she talks about the woman that came to support the camp and why. It was Nightwatch's job to look after the women while they slept, ensuring the convoy did not leave the base unchallenged and to keep the home fires burning. The importance of the fire was obvious uh, and uh, the law was later changed to prevent them, not that we listened. The fire provided warmth, a place for cooking and somewhere to heat your water for washing. I think many of us will remember the tin bath that you filled and put on the fire at 10 in the morning and enjoyed your shower at nine that night. The fire, more importantly, was the centre of our vibrant community, a symbol for our togetherness. One woman may sit by the fire, but she will not sit alone for long, which was indicative of the essence of the Greenham women. United we stand, divided we fall. So basically, Having worked with all these amazing people and created all these different pieces, uh, we've uh, made uh, the, the animal teams design this absolutely fantastic site, partly in 2D and partly in 3D, that you get to find all these things on. Um, and it's been really amazing to work with them on that. Um, and to work with all those women and all those amazing artists. Uh, so I encourage you to go and have a little treasure hunt. Uh, I'm going to go into uh, one of the things about that uh, is really exciting about Greenham and art uh, is how many songs it produced. The Greenham Songbook is legendary. And there are some amazing, amazing folk singers that took the Greenham message out from Greenham into the wider world. And one of those was Peggy Seeger. We've been very privileged to work with her and Frankie Armstrong in our work uh, on this on this amazing uh, exhibition. And um, and I spoke to Peggy, and she very kindly gave me permission to use this uh, next song of hers. Um, it crops up in the film Carry Greenham Home, a must watch if you get the chance and haven't already. And it also is um, something that I used to sing a lot when I was running and having to run uh, the Reclaim the Night marches in London when I was a younger baby activist. So um, I'm going to sing you Peggy, Singer's, Peggy Seeger's Reclaim the Night as both a link to the work that second wave feminists and radical feminists were doing at Greenham and all the feminists were doing there and also about the work women were doing in a wider sphere to try and protect women uh, from violence and to end violence and the work that women are still doing and that we still have to do. Though Eve was made from Adam's rib, nine months he lay within her crib. How can a man of woman born thereafter use her sex with scorn? For though we bear the human race, to us is given but second place. And some men place us lower still by using us against our will. For if we choose to walk alone, for us there is no safety zone. If we're attacked, we bear the blame. They say that we began the game. And though you prove your injury, the judge may set the rapist free. Therefore, the victim is to blame. Call it nature, but rapes the name.
We claim the night and win the day. We want the rights that should be our own. A freedom women have seldom known. The right to live, the right to walk alone without fear. A husband has his lawful rights, can take his wife whenever he likes, and courts uphold time after time that rape in marriage is no crime. The choice is hers and hers alone. Submit or lose your kids and home when love becomes a legal claim. Call it duty, but rape's the name. And if a man should rape a child, it's not because his spirit's wild. Our system gives the prize to all who trample on the weak and small. When fathers rape, they surely know their kids have nowhere else to go. Try to forget, don't ask us to forgive them. They know what they do. Reclaim the night and win the day. We want the right that should be our own. A freedom women have seldom known. The right to live, the right to walk alone without fear. When exploitation is the norm, rape is found in many forms. Lower wages mean at tasks, poorer schooling second class we serve our own then like the men we serve employers it follows then that bodies raped is nothing new but just a servant's final due we've raised our voices in the past and this time will not be the last our body's gift is ours to give not payment for the right to live. Since we've outgrown the status quo, we claim the right to answer no. Without consent, he stakes a claim. Call it rape, for rape's the name. Reclaim the night and win the day. We want the right that should be our own. A freedom women have seldom known. The right to live, the right to walk alone without fear. Sorry, I find that kind of hard to get through. The uh, the middle verse about the fathers really gets me. Um, but yeah, thanks for bearing with. It's an important song, isn't it? I'll... Uh, I expect you can all sing a better version and send it to us on social media and that would be great. Let's share it. Let's not perfect it. Let's share it. Okay. I'm going to read you now um, a very different sort of story, but it's by, um, it's by a wonderful friend of mine and one of my oldest friends, a friend of mine from university called Lorna Partington, who uh, wrote something about, again, it's, like, it's the same, I've chosen it because it's the same story of struggle and adversity and and a woman's climb, I suppose. Um, but it's uh, got a very different timbre, but it's got that same inner strength. So it's a different outer vibe to that song, but it's got that same, it's got that same strong womanly core. I'm excited to share it with you. Okay, I think that it's an exclusive as well. I don't think she's um, had anyone else read this to be put in in public. So I'm quite flattered and excited that she's chosen us. Okay, this is called Liberty Dock, and it's by Lorna Partington. The sun is high and the tide is turning. At this hour, the houseboats of Liberty Dock rise and the gangplanks moan. Alana heads for the far end of the dock along a broadwalk lined with large, multicoloured pots full of succulents. They have concentric leaves like swollen petals. Uh, past houseboats decorated with tiki totems, tribal masks, sea dragons, karakans and mermaids. Mirror mosaics flash in the sunlight. A white whale weather vane pivots on its spindle in a puff of breeze that also makes the wind chime tinkle and dream catches twist. She stops a moment to admire a voluptuous wood-carved siren with opaque sea glass eyes. But it feels wrong to look so boldly at the blind. 
Nearly at the end of the deck, she arrives at the houseboat that is to be her retreat, a place with no name, only a number. Its exterior is humble. It wouldn't be out of place in a trailer park. Inside, too, it is understated, but in a smart city apartment way. Perhaps the other residents despise their utilitarian neighbour for undermining the bohemian spirit of the dock. Right now, however, she is grateful for its simplicity. After dropping her luggage in the bedroom, Alana opens a bottle of wine and heads for the rear deck. Strung beneath the canopy, hammocks hangs in a lazy smile. She doubts there is any graceful way of getting into it or out of it, and wonders if she should risk ending up in the water. Now, that's her problem right there. That kind of thinking. The limiting kind. Here on Liberty Dock, she will let all her thoughts be more expansive. After all, she has a whole new life to envision. A glass of red wine in hand, she listens to the fish jumping and the noises of the residents' lunch, laughter and the clink-clank of crockery. People seem happier here. It's the perfect place to escape the decay of Alais, and already Alana feels lighter. She sleeps poorly that night. She always does the first night in a different bed. But the next day, she is up with the dawn, determined to steal a march on the day. She reads a little, visits the other docks, eats quite a lot, and drinks too much, ends up on the day that deck on the, on the ends up the day back on the rear deck. Now I've had a bit too much drink before I read this to you. Journaling for the first time since her teens and feeling vaguely pathetic about it. When the only illumination is the light uh, bulbs around her head, the string of them, she can hardly see what she's writing. Hey stranger, falls a man on a paddleboard. Oh hi, she says, somewhat startled by the figure in the dark. Come on over to the Archangel for a drink later. Everyone welcome, he says. Oh, thanks. Uh, where, where is that? Last houseboat on the right, he replies, and off he paddles, skirting the inlet to invite everyone he meets. She doesn't want to go to the party, but she must force herself. She cannot keep hiding, cannot go on living in the empty shell of her former life. Still, many of her still married friends tell her they're envious. You're totally free. You can go wherever, do anything. The ideas they offer her for exploiting her freedom reveal a lot more about the state of their marriages than about what she should do next with her life. And what these still married friends all fail to understand is that the definition of total freedom is that you are responsible for nobody and nobody is responsible for you. Total freedom is indistinguishable from total loneliness. And very few people can bear to be completely untethered for long. Alana can see that this is understood at Liberty Dock, a place where no one is totally free to float off into the bay, but everyone feels more liberated than the land lovers. They are free enough. There are about two dozen Liberty Dockers aboard the Archangel when she arrives. Of course, she is the only single person, something she's getting used to. She smiles at some couples, but not engage her in conversation. So she occupies herself by looking around the houseboat. It's on two levels with portholes for windows along the sides and a wall of glass at the bay facing end. The decor is nautical down to the smallest detail. Hey, are you from number 40? Says the guy she supposes is the paddle boarder. I am, she says, shaking his hand. Glad you could make it. I'm Ed. She gives him a bottle of wine. Thanks, let's open it. She follows him into the galley where a few people are leaning against the countertops and talking amiably. They pause to acknowledge their host. Everyone, this is... Um... Hi everyone, I'm Joni. She invents a name because she's sick of being herself. Why not be someone else for a night? She has total freedom after all. As people tell her their names that she won't remember for long, Ed removes the cork from the bottle and pours some wine into a plastic cup for her. Love your accent, says one of the guests. Where is it from? She hates this question. It always leads to a variation of the same conversation. I'm from England, she says. Oh, I got family in Guildford. Do you know it? N not, not very well. Oh, well, I love your accent. Someone else asks, so what brings you to the States? Another question she hates, because the honest answer, I married an American, inevitably leads to revealing the divorce. A subject that only bums people out and makes them wonder what is so divorceable about her. So she opts for a less risky answer. Oh, um, I came over to work in Hollywood, she says. Some eyes light up and she spends the next ten minutes being quizzed on what that entails, keeping it upbeat, of course. 
people don't want to hear about the countless meetings that seem to be building to something until the project suddenly collapses without explanation. Uh, neither are they interested in the young studio executives who until the previous year had been the assistant in charge of Xeroxing. And nobody, nobody ever wants to know about the unglamorous hours she spends in LA traffic, driving between studios, holding the wheel tightly to keep a grip on the frustration that her career could explode, make her explode in homicidal road rage at any moment. Everyone only wants to know if they've seen any of the films that she's been involved with and which of the luminaries she's met are actually assholes. Finally, the conversation diversifies, but she soon feels like an outsider among these long-term residents, so she withdraws. She attempts to engage in some more small talk in the living room, but doesn't want to have the same two conversations repeatedly. Drunk, she ends up on the roof deck. She drops into a deck chair that's lower than she thought, causing her to spill a little wine down herself. She looks across at the calm black water of the bay to the twinkling lights on the opposite shore, little signals of domesticity. Suddenly, the tide, the melancholy tide of nostalgia, rises up inside her. Her vision swims for a moment, and before she can stop them, tears come spilling out. Shit, she whispers, stemming the overflow of the napkin. This happens a lot since he left her, several times a week, randomly, in public, in private, even in her sleep. Grief is a strong, muscular fish that can surface anywhere, anytime. You okay? says Ed, taking a seat beside her. He smiles and reaches across with the bottle of wine to fill up her cup. I'm fine. It's nothing. I don't expect you to tell me. Like, we only just met. That would be awkward. How, how very un-American of you. Everyone here tells you they're in therapy within five minutes of meeting you. Uh, they do in California, that's true, but I'm from the Midwest, so I'm as repressed as you Brits. <laughs> yeah, really repressed, <laughs> she says, waving her sodden handkerchief and smiling ruefully. They sit a while in comfortable silence until Ed asks, Ever paddleboarded at night? Most grateful for a change of topic, she shakes her head. Never even paddleboarded during the day. He says, being on the water in the dark is the best. <laughs> it sounds dangerous. He swallows some wine and looks out over the bay. Somehow, it feels safer. When you're out there in the dark, your focus is sharper, it makes you more, feel more alive or in tune, I guess. More of both those things sound good. But I hope you're not suggesting we do it now. I'm, I'm hopelessly and depressively drunk. Of course not. Another night. I promise you'll love it. <sighs> okay, sure, I leave on Wednesday. Then I'll swing by on Tuesday after dark. Try to be sober. I'll do my best. She stands to leave, but falls back into her seat. Embarrassed, she laughs and rests her hand, her head on her hands. You're probably not that drunk, says Ed. It's the way the houseboat moves. You can't feel it when you're sober, but it can floor you if your equilibrium is, should we say, impaired. He gets to his feet and holds out both hands to help her up. Some emotions are that way too. She looks up at him with a wry smile. Now that was very Californian of you. She takes his hands and pulls herself up, gripping them for an extra few seconds to ensure that she has her sea legs. Ed escorts her back to her houseboat and she briefly wonders if she wanted him to make a pass at her, but decides she doesn't. She just wants to sleep and forget everything. The next day she writes a sizable chunk of script. It's a huge relief to know that words, at least, have not forsaken her, and it gives her confidence that she can complete a first draft on this trip, although, as always, the ending is bound to give her grief. All endings do. The day after that, she gets up early and drives a long, winding road to the beach for the sound of crashing waves, a welcome change from the gentle lapping of the bay. Large bundles of seaweed sprawl on the sand like sunbathers in rags, Dogs rescue balls from the tumbling waves and children carry wet, grey sand in buckets to castles they'll soon tire of building. She hikes the fire road up to the cooftop, long, steep incline, which makes her heart pump harder and harder till her head and her hands thump to the rhythm. This kind of strain her heart can take. But the pain of his betrayal with an ex-girlfriend, hardly before the ink was dry on the divorce settlement, that nearly stopped her heart forever. Six months ago, she wouldn't have believed him capable. But how 
quickly the people we love can become strangers. At the top of the fire road, a narrow footpath branches off. The trail follows the cliff edge. The Pacific booms far below and onshore breezes play mournful notes through the fence posts. The trail is arduous and although she knows she won't make it to the end, she doesn't give up too soon, going as far as her strength will allow because that is what she's good at. She returns to the houseboat, houseboat for a full afternoon of writing on the deck and the words keep flowing. On her final evening, she's so caught up in writing that Ed's sudden arrival in the gloom gives her a fright. He pulls up his paddleboard, pulling another beside him. Oh, I was hoping you'd forget, she says, lowering the lid of her laptop. I am the night boarding evangelist. I never let a potential convert escape. Oh, I'm still not sure about this. We're only paddling around the dark. There's plenty of light. You'll be totally safe. She sighs and gives him a resigned smile. Okay, preacher man, give me a minute to change. She goes off and returns barefoot, wearing shorts and a sweater. Nervous little fish roll around in her stomach. Let's go before I overthink it, she says. Ed hops off his board to help her onto hers, cuffing one of her feet with an anklet attached to a cord. Free enough, she thinks. Handing her the paddle, he says, you got this. He returns to his board and sets off. She follows him gingerly as she gets used to her primitive vessel, letting her eyes adjust to the ambient light. Soon, though, Ed is off on his own. Relaxing her limbs, she tries to find her rhythm, which takes a while. At last, she gets it, and she finds that Ed was right. In the darkness, her senses and mind are sharper. She feels she's inhabiting every inch of her body and is surprisingly grateful she doesn't have the ability to see clearly what's ahead or behind. Here, now, in this moment, is all there is and all there needs to be. More at peace than at any time in the last year, Alana carries on pedalling, correcting her course when she needs to, keeping her mind on each movement, sound, breath, and feeling at one with the, serene, the siren sculpture with the opaque sea glass eyes, whose blindness she no longer pities. Well, now I'm going to finish up and I'm going to say to you, get onto that online digital website, that Greenham Women Digital. Um, it's all over our social media at the moment. Um, I'm really keen to find out what you, what you, what your experiences are with it. Please let us know. Let's get feedback. Um, and as I think I mentioned, some of the lots of the stuff you can find on there, as well as interviews. Uh, uh, articles, images uh, and little scenes um, is also lots of songs so I'm going to finish with um, a really a really sweet example of um, the kind of songs that the Greenham women um, filled their Greenham songbook with uh, they're not um, they're not all uh, made up originally uh, like the ones that Peggy and Frankie would make up and lots of women did make up some fantastic original songs but they also used to take existing songs and put their own words to it and for some reason this one really tickles me and you will recognise the tune um, straight away <laughs> um, so I think that's a lot of fun to finish on um, a final plug um, let's uh, meet again we've got a Christmas special that's going to be it this year Christmas special and we're going to do it completely live so not these like these where I do it as live um, you know record it all the way through as you can hear warts and all Sorry, Peggy, for putting a bit of a wart in your gorgeous song. Um, but uh, but but uh, and then I sit on the message board, as you know, and, and play and, and talk to you while you watch it. Um, but uh, an actual live stream um, with some chums, hopefully some special bits and pieces. I'm going to do an interview with Jackie Fleming. She's been drawing for us this whole se all the seasons this year. So it should be really good fun. And we'll have to do lots of festive hijinks in that to get another glitter on for sure. But for now, that's on the 16th of December. Please, please come to that. For now, join me raising a glass to green and women everywhere. Here's to them. And now, here's a song for them. When you're alone and life is making you lonely, you can always go to the peace camp. When you got worries, all the noise and the hurry seem to stop, I know, at the peace camp. Linger at the main gate where the benders are so pretty. When it's time for action, we get down to nitty gritty. How can you lose? 
campfires are much brighter there you can forget all your troubles forget all your cares and the peace camp where women's eyes are bright peace camp waiting for you tonight peace camp you're gonna be all right Don't hang around and let your problems surround you. You won't be alone at the peace camp. Maybe you know some little places to go where you can slip the fence near a silo. Listen to the voices of the women who are blockading. Before long you'll sing with them, your fears will be fading. Together we're strong. Campfires are much brighter there You can forget all your troubles Express all your cares at the peace camp Waiting eyes are bright peace